quote Geoffrey Farthing, all existence is one thing. This one thing is variously called the one life, the one reality. It is the source of being and of all beings. It is everything. In fact, it is everything and there is nothing else. The root of all nature, objective and subjective, and everything else in the universe, visible and invisible, is, was, and ever will be one absolute essence, from which all starts and into which everything returns. In a subsequent study, this fundamental fact must never be lost from sight. All forms come into being, from atom to men, are animated by the same life. The forms disintegrate, that life remains. We human beings are one with it. Our life is that life. Explaining how theosophy views God, soul and man, HPB states, in their origin and in eternity, the three, like the universe and all therein, are one with the absolute unity, the unknowable deific essence. All is one, is the greatest and most profound truth, the greatest mystery that man can know. It is so deceptively simple and direct, man sees, man sees it, but doesn't see it at all. It is so obvious, I have rarely heard it discussed specifically. It is so vast, it has consequences way beyond man's perception. HPB says that unless we keep this idea of unity in the mind like a mantra, a burning flame at all times, all knowledge in life eventually becomes meaningless and futile. If all is one, nothing can have its existence outside or apart from the one. Therefore, the opposite of the one is the act of separation. With this understanding of unity, many orthodox religions lose their meaning and understanding. The Abrahamic religions require separation. God creates man and separates from him due to original sin. If man is good, he lives with God. And if, and if bad, he lives permanently apart from God. And if that wasn't bad enough, in the Middle Ages, just to make things more spicy, you became the ingredients in some kind of infernal barbecue. But God still loved you. They named this separation evil and personified it with the name the devil or Satan, who is not on God's side, although once he worked for him, but they fell out. But they never made it quite clear where the devil came from, or if not from God, and what is going to happen to him when it's all over. The Old Testament God comes across as a guy who'd sooner kill you than look at you. In his capacity for inflicting catastrophic acts of murderous violence upon the soft, helpless animals in his charge. To quote a lapse vicar friend of mine, the Old Testament God was best compared to a prepubescent psychopath with an ant farm. Now this would be laughable if it wasn't so tragic that people are being killed today in the name of sectarian tribal religion because they are unable to grow up spiritually. They are brainwashed, programmed and mentally entrenched within the dross of past primitive superstitions. It is reckoned from Inquisition records that in the region of 50 million men, women and children were tortured and burnt to death over the 600 years of church tyranny of power. The famous statement that if we don't teach history, we are doomed to repeat it, and need I say more. 
even today with the warring factions of Islam. And that's a bit like the weather we've been having. having. Some days are sunny and some, some days are Shiite. So, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've heard even that uh, they, were, they were strapping explosives to dogs and using that in one. And they were calling them terrorists. <laughs> so. In our obsession with the bitter roots of sectarian differences and selfish materialist agendas, we remain, remain blind to the reality of life as one being. As HPB once said, real philosophy is altruism, and we cannot repeat it too often. It is brotherly, sisterly love, mutual help, and unswerving devotion to truth, which I think is a good soundbite for theosophy. The religious reject our theosophical message of unity because they are emotionally attached to some spiritual parent and not willing and are too fearful uh, to let go. Atheists and materialist scientists reject our theosophical message of unity because they are terrified there might be something outside their perception and control that they don't like and is unknown. Uh, many have invested their lives in honing and, praise, and praising their intelligence and couldn't possibly relinquish this golden treasure. Fortunately or unfortunately, the majority are so distracted by life's rich tapestry, they're not awake enough to reject anything. So God here is a different creature to man, a separate greater being of the imagination in a scary world and this makes no sense whatsoever in theosophical terms. Here is an interesting question. If this anthropomorphic God concept is so obviously nonsense, why has the theosophical divine wisdom of unity not replaced it? Religious institutions have a vested interest in keeping their flock as spiritual children. Flock and that says it all, a flock of sheep, not the hermetic renaissance sovereignty of mankind, the oration on the dignity of man by Pico della Mirandola. Materialist scientists simply reject religion and a dialogue is then set up between the two, leaving the alternative approach and the theosophical approach out with the fairies. I suppose the simple and shocking answer is, in my opinion, that modern Western man is too immature to know, gnosis, of the fundamental unity as expressed by the divine wisdom. Yes, he or she is sophisticated and technologically advanced, but in my experience, is more naive than ancient man. He or she is a mere child spiritually. We hear the usual trite questions. Do you believe in God? Does God exist? This is partly due to the historical aftermath of indoctrination by state religion, the very poor educational standard and the media distraction. He or she is anethnotized. They do not want you to wake up and think for yourself. You could, you would be too dangerous. Who created God to enable him, her or it to be separated from man? Obviously man created this kind of concept of a parochial, a tribal or idol, a Zeus sitting on a cloud. Man invented this all-powerful anthropomorphic God, but man always held his reins in the pursuit of power. Whoever had the ear of God had the power and authority to rule. In ancient times, when one tribe conquered another tribe, that tribe would take on the other tribe's God as he was more powerful. This is now an old paradigm. These crude and primitive imaginings need not concern us here. Another consequence, fear and evil are the result of inadequate imaginings of man. Evil is the opposite of oneness, i.e. evil is, on a basic level, the result of separateness. 
to perpetuate the lie, the illusion that not all is one. This generates a lack of empathy and compassion, the most dangerous power on earth. It was interesting that the, that the conclusion of the Nuremberg trials, when such evil was exposed to the world, the shock was beyond comprehension that such civilized, articulate and cultured people could perform such genocide on such an efficient and industrial scale. The shock for those taking part in the prosecution of the trial, that the accused were not demons with horns and claws, but quite ordinary, pathetic folk. But it was commented on that these men in the dock lacked empathy and compassion for their fellow man. The sad thing about this is that man has not learned anything since. Mass genocide has been committed in every decade on most continents since the Second World War and continues today unabated. Even now, Buddhists in Burma, Myanmar, are killing and ethnically cleansing Muslims. What is all that about? If you have experienced true love and compassion for another human being, just think how different this world would be if you could extend this to every human being, being a citizen of the universe. A famous quote from Albert Einstein in 1954, year of my birth. A human being is part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings are something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. But he goes on and says, the true value of a human being is determined by the measure and the sense in which they have obtained liberation from the self. We shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if humanity is to survive. Theosophy can supply that new thinking. And here, another quote from a great man, David Bohm, who knew Einstein very well, from his book, The Wholeness, and the implicit or in the implicate order in 1980 and I uh, the last the last part of this I I find is quite uh, quite frightening in itself because he says the notion that all these fragments is separately existent is evidently an illusion this illusion could not do other than lead to endless conflict and confusion Indeed, the attempt to live according to the notion that the fragments are really separate is, in essence, what has led to the growing series of extremely urgent crises that is confronting us today. Thus, as is now well known, this way of life have brought about pollution, destruction of balance of nature, overpopulation, worldwide economic and political disorder and the creation of an overall environment that is neither physically nor mentally healthy for most people to live in. Individually, there has developed a widespread feeling of helplessness and despair, and particularly this, in the face of that seems to be an overwhelming mass of disparate social forces going beyond the control and even the comprehension of human beings. 
who are caught up in it. However, it's not all doom and gloom. One of my uh, great heroes was Marcus Aurelius in his uh, works, The Meditations. And he said, and this was written in about 1, 170 AD, surprisingly modern, all things are woven together and the common bond is sacred and scarcely one thing is foreign to another for they have been arranged together in their places and together make the same ordered universe for there is one universe out of all one god through all one substance and one law one common reason of all intelligent creatures and one truth frequently we cons uh, we consider the connection of all things in the universe we should not say I am an Athenian or I am a Roman or Shiite or Sunni for that matter but I'm a citizen of the universe this world is set up to divide us xenophobia racism nationalism sectarianism religious bigotry the TS objects brother sisterly brother and sisterhood without distinction of race creed sex caste or color i am a devonian a wessex man an englishman a european a westerner an earthling but really i'm just a citizen of the universe with the only thing to offer is my humanity even Leibniz in the time of um, Newton said reality cannot be found except in one single source because of the interconnectedness of all things with one another. I do not conceive of any reality at all as without genuine unity. Now the secret doctrine, we have three fundamental propositions. And this is just a summary, these are not the actual words itself. But the first one, existence stems from an unknown principle of which spirit and matter are um, complementary aspects. This principle is beyond speculation. Then we have space is infinite and eternal and is the home of numerous universes which come and go with everything subject to process of evolution. The evolutionary process is cyclic and subject to alternating periods of activity and rest. And the third one, which we all know all this uh, well, all souls are part of universal oversoul, which is itself an aspect of the unknown principle. All souls are subject to a cycle of death and rebirth, and all action is governed by a law which balances cause and effect known as karma. Behind these three propositions, is the necessity of unity from this unity from time to time universes come into objective reality evolve and return to the one so what is this universe how can this assist our understanding what does science tell us about the evidence i'd like to just show you a, a short a short film Things encapsulates this, and I'll go on to talk about it. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first 
invent the universe. The tighter physics have tried to grasp onto physical reality, to understand what it's really made of, what are the core building blocks of life at the basis of it all. Life, the universe, slips through your fingers. And you come up with something that's increasingly abstract, increasingly abstract, to come to the realm of pure abstraction. And that's what the unified idea, yeah, field is. It's pure abstract potential, pure abstract being, pure abstract self-aware consciousness. We live in what he calls a participatory universe. Rather than thinking of the universe as something that's already created and that we're plopped down in the middle of it, having these experiences, what Dr. Wheeler is suggesting is that the universe is a result of what we are doing in our lives. He says we're tiny patches of the universe looking at itself and creating itself along the way. Now, this is a, a radical concept because it suggests that when we look into the world of the quantum atom for that most minute, ultimate particle, we may never find it. Because every time we look, the act of looking is consciousness placing, creating, building something there for us to see. And when we look into the expanses, the vast expanses of our universe, searching for the very edge of what we call creation, we may never find it. Because the act of consciousness searching is the creative force that puts something in place. One of the consequences of modern physics is that the, as I think Sir James Jeans said, that uh, the world begins to look more like a giant thought than a giant machine. Um, what he meant is that uh, down deep in the quantum view of the world, that the thing that is most important is information and knowledge. That that seems to be the driver of everything. And in addition, the more you look at individual particles, the more you realize that there is no such thing as one electron. An electron or any elementary particle exists only in relationship to other things, like other particles or, or the universe at large. This means that, that deeply enough, when you deep dive down into the nature of matter, everything we know about the, the everyday world dissolves. There are no objects anymore, there are only relationships. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos. How likely is it that we'd find a protein by chance with all the amino acids in that prebiotic soup interacting with each other for, say, billions of years? Then give it a lot of time. How likely is it that we'd ever get a protein to arise by chance? Oh my goodness. So the odds of building even a short functional protein by chance alone is 74 plus 20. Huh? You can remember how you do this in math. You can add the exponents if you're multiplying exponential numbers. Thank you very much, okay? Wow. Now, can anyone get their mind around a number that big? There's only 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the entire universe. There's only 10 to the 16th seconds since the, the Big Bang. There's only 10 to the 139th total events since the, the beginning of the universe. When you measure a particle, the act of measurement forces the particle to relinquish all of the possible places it could have been and select one definite location where you find it. The act of measurement is what forces the particle to make that choice. Going into space, mathematics, quantum mechanics, the secrets of the universe, it's all there. Life is fiery with its beauty, its incredible detail. Tuning into it, they want to shut your mind, talking about Justin Bieber. If electrons and protons and neutrons are not matter, but rather a form of gravitationally trapped light, 
That means matter does not exist. Matter is a word that has been concocted by science to describe a phenomenon that is not truly understood. So, if what appears to be physical around us is not matter, and our bodies are not matter, then who and what are we? And what is this universe that surrounds us? Moore's law dictates that computing power doubles approximately every two years. And eventually we're going to reach the stage where computers can artificially create a virtual reality which is indistinguishable from our own, which begs the question, how do we know it hasn't already been done? When two objects are entangled with one another, they share a peculiar connection. For example, if I were to take these two molecules and entangle them with one another, I could then take them to opposite ends of the universe, and yet, they'd still be connected. Anything I did to this molecule would instantaneously affect this one. Where was I before I was born? Where will I be after I die? Who am I? If in asking those questions, something gets ignited inside of you, some flame of inquiry, some igniting of consideration that there's something going on here that is really mysterious. If you are excited by such things as what I've just mentioned, these kinds of questions, then you're becoming spiritually awakened. And now the question is, how much awakening are you willing to sustain in your life? Are you willing to walk in a completely awakened state all of the time? Do you think that's possible? The deeper you go in the structure of natural law, the less material, the less inert, the less dead the universe is, the more alive, the more conscious the universe becomes. Then when you get to the foundation of the universe, the unified field or super strength field, it's simply a field of pure being, pure intelligence. Intelligence because it's the fountainhead of all the laws of nature all the fundamental forces, all the fundamental particles, all the laws governing life at every level of the universe have their unified source in the unified field. That makes the unified field the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature. Non-material, dynamic, self-aware intelligence. Those are the properties of the unified field. In the last five or so years, I've been able to show that hidden inside of these equations, there are computer codes. They're the kind of computer codes that make browsers work. And so if the equations that describe our reality have computer codes hidden in them, that's just kind of weird. So what is our universe? The cosmos exists as a developing idea within the field of consciousness of a being whose true nature is beyond all conception. All celestial bodies and the and entities inhabiting them are thus partial expressions of the same process of ideation and its associated consciousness. It is a modern misconception that our local bounded universe came out of nothing. This came about as a result of scientific materialism and the theory of the Big Bang. What was before the Big Bang? Oh, nothing. The problem that material Newtonian science tries to avoid at all costs is the idea of first cause. The universe came from a Big Bang, a quantum fluctuation, a random accidental event. The old argument of if you spend long enough throwing bits of scrap metal over the wall of a scrapyard, Eventually, through random processes and a long, long period of time, a red Ferrari sports car will emerge through the gates, ready to drive away. Uh, and I think we've already seen about the functional protein there of uh, a chance of 1 times 10 to the 165. I mean, that's 10 with 164 zeros after it. And that's one protein. 
never mind a bunny rabbit, you know. I mean, that's, that comes later. Nothing ever came from nothing. I suggest especially accepting the first proposition of a principle beyond speculation, that our universe came out of not nothing, but out of a state of everything. To, you, to use a, well, I was going to use a posh analogy, but I'll probably have to use just a bottle of water here. Um, a glass of champagne in a room. Now, uh, the, these three things up here, chaos, theos, and cosmos, as if you like, is, is from a Gnostic background, but it translates into the theosophical side. If you can imagine a glass of champagne is the room in which, uh, for our purposes, goes on forever. It is space, the unknown principle, the ocean of abundance. The Greek Gnostic term was sige, or silence. Whoops. Um, which is eternal and infinite and beyond speculation. Theos is actually the glass of champagne with the liquid in it. These are analogies, obviously. The champagne glass and the liquid in it represents the paroma, the fullness, the universal consciousness, described in many ways, bounded consciousness, the gods, Yani Chohans, angels, divas. It's an information field, spirit of mankind, the intelligence, the sparks within the ten kingdoms, soul and soul groups. That's the liquid inside the bottle. But inside that liquid are bubbles. And the cosmos is like the bubble. On the other hand, it's formed literally out of the substance of the liquid or the champagne, but is not the champagne. It is bounded, lacking in the full substance, deficient or lacking, known as hysterema in Greek. It is finite and bounded. And as a bubble, it comes into existence, it evolves up the glass and is reabsorbed. The local universe becomes a container in which movement, action, change, interaction, and subsequently experience is generated. You could call the cosmos a matter generator, container, virtual reality stage, a cosmic brain, an event horizon, a duality machine spiritual mirroring device, a soul crash, experience simulator. And Bubble's quite good, um, if you like. This is the ideas of, of what's there. 70% they've got no idea about whatsoever, and the other 25% they still got no idea about. Um, and the other 4% is hydrogen and helium. That leaves tiny little slither uh, out from there where we have neutrinos, which are these uh, neutral um, particles. Billions are going through your finger right now at this time. And we are basically come under the heavy element side of it. So it's 0.03%. <laughs> so to me, it's a very, uh, a bubble is quite a, a, a good analogy for that. Um, Now, I don't have time to go through the whole of this um, form here, but um, to use a Gnostic myth using the old language, I think describes it quite well. It says, God the Father, out of chaos, created the aeons, which is the theos we were just talking about, out of love. It is within God's power to make perfect beings, and such beings would be devoid of will. Puppets could not experience bliss, earned out of understanding and effort. As long as creatures are devoid of their own will, freely exercised, they are automatons and not autonomous. In order to make sense out of his desire to create independent entities, God had to give the aeons the power of free choice, even if it meant that they might choose to move out of his area of his love and or dishonor him or simply become forgetful in all the complexity. 
It is said that as a final gesture, God withdrew the operation of his will, Thelema, over the aeons and bestowed upon them the gift of free will, letting them determine their own destiny. This is expressed in Gnostic writings as saying that there was a contraction of the divine will at this stage. As God is one and the unity, the removal of his will would naturally be accompanied by the withdrawal of the divine presence from a region in space. The process of emptying kenosis left a vacant place for what was to become the natural universe we call. In Gnostic writings, a cognate word is kenoma, signifying emptiness, describes the elusive phenomenal world of space and time in which we live. It is to be noted that by obscuring himself in this way, God made the place where the world occurs, but he is not that place. The exercise of free will requires an area for its operation, and this resulted in certain catastrophic consequences. Where the will of the Father was withdrawn, the will of the opposing archons prevailed. Where the writ of the goodness did not run, evil emerged. Where his spirit was removed, matter came forth. Where his light was withdrawn, darkness supervened. Instead of love and provenance, there was now law and fatality. And where there had been life, there was now death. Yet it must be remembered that nothing could have its existence without God or the Absolute. And when the God will is apparently absent, his erstwhile presence has left its permanent imprint. Basilides a second century Gnostic too emphasized the essential presence of God in all circumstances and situations. When he said that the empty place resulting from God's withdrawal did not ever cease to show traces of his divine brightness. The vacated place re retained the flavor of the Father, just as a bowl of sweet smelling unction remains, uh, remains the fragrance even after the bowl had been entirely emptied. No place is therefore quite devoid of divine flavor. And the empty topos location might be spoken of as a mixture of good and evil, light and darkness, the symbolism of the checkerboard of a Masonic lodge. When you walk across the floor, you stand on both the black and white squares. You can't help it. This sets the scene so what does modern science says on this subject? Well, science bears this out. I mean, that short film we just had there, I think could have been done by a theosophist. And those are modern scientists. Wheeler that he referred to is probably a, you know, a, a figure like Einstein is today of the same sort of uh, ilk. Modern science tells us that our local universe is finite, that there are numberless other universes that may be different or similar uh, and have uh, similar laws and structures. That the universe is a dynamic system that comes into existing existence and goes out of existence over time. What is between these universes? Are they connected in some way to form a greater system? There are a number of advanced theories that suggest a multiverse, but for our purposes and the time allowed, we will be parochial and stick to our own universe as unity. It is an axiom of theosophy that there is no such thing as dead matter, that there is only consciousness and the universe is conscious. It is a being. Our local universe is a container which contains individual or discrete consciousnesses that interact and create experience. These discrete consciousnesses evolve back towards unity. In the words of Henry Bergson, the universe is a machine for making gods. God making is a process, the path of involution and evolution from one into the many and back to the one. Zen often puts the three hour lecture into one sentence. So uh, I think this probably uh, exemplifies it. When the 10,000 things are viewed in their oneness, we return to the origin and re remain where we have always been. This starts to make real sense 
We start with the first principle, which is beyond speculation, which I shall call here the absolute, that expresses itself in the form of an object existence, which we know as our universe. Let's look at the physiology of our bounded universe. It is homogeneous, filamental structure, very similar to the human brain. It resembles a holographic and fractal structure and organization and substance, very similar to the human brain. It has a neural network powered by electricity, FOHAT, very similar to the human brain. It is made of physical matter and processes information, very similar to a human brain. Maybe the human brain is the microcosm and the bounded universe is the macrocosm. They are both have the same intrinsic form and structure. Explaining the hermetic axiom that which is above is like that which is below and that which is below is like that which is above to achieve the wonder of the one thing. There is nothing that is not arranged in order. It is by order above all else that the cosmos itself is born upon its course. Nay, the cosmos consists solely of order. I don't have time to go through this now, unfortunately, but the holographic principle, if you imagine this as the, the bubble, this is very much the latest thinking that's going on. Uh, that the holographic principle is a property of quantum gravity. Don't, if you don't understand any of this, don't worry. I mean, you know, you can uh, um, pick it up at some other time. It's a property of quantum gravity and string theory that states that the description of a volume of space can be thought of as encoded on the boundary of a region outside of the bubble, preferably a light-like boundary like a gravitational horizon. Thorne observed in 78 that string theory admits a lower dimensional description in which gravity emerges uh, from it uh, what we would now call in a holographic way. In a larger, more speculative sense, the theory suggests that the entire universe can be seen as a two-dimensional information structure painted on the cosmological horizon, such that three dimensions we observe are only the effect, effective description of a, micro, a microcosmic scale and at low energies. Cosmological um, holography has not been made mathematical, mathematically precise, partly because the cosmological horizon has a finite area and grows with time. This is a very exciting area of science and fits nicely to the analogy of the bubble, the 2D surface providing all the information for a 3D volume. There's a new word coined here. We heard the word pixel here on the, so there's now a word voxel, which is a three-dimensional pixel, which would account for the holographic forms that uh, we're here. Um, I'm gonna have to cut a lot. It should be half past, is it? Is the, more, what about then? 20, 22. Oh, right. Can I? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll I'll take questions afterwards at tea, if maybe the the thing. If I could just go on just a little bit more. In the quantum world, in the quantum world, every particle in the universe winks in and out of the quantum field. Particles can transition into waves and spread in all directions. An electron's position in, uh, in a probability state, which spreads out throughout the whole universe until it is observed and at that time the wave function collapses and an electron is a, is a particle. In other words, consciousness determines reality. If you want to see fear in the eye of a quantum physicist, just mention the measurement question. But this non-materiality actually lies much closer than everyone supposes. What if there is physical evidence that the brain is a quantum device and that it's design reflects the cosmos in an uncanny way that cannot be by chance. In the Vedic and Hermetic traditions, it is held that as is the smallest, so is the largest, as is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. 
We're using modern terminology, but the concept is timeless. Nature is coherent from its subtlest level to the grossest. Some clues to this truth are visual. The helix that appears in DNA and the spiral nebulae, for example. Hard science isn't moved by casual resemblances, but esoteric science is. It is the correspondences. However, to tighten the parallels, one can turn to recent work by physicists, including uh, Kriovkov, and reported in mainstream journals like Nature Scientific Reports to quote, the universe may be growing in the same way as a giant brain, with the electrical firing between brain cells mirrored by the shape of expanding galaxies. Looking at simulations of galaxy interconnections in the early universe and neuron interconnections make it virtually impossible to tell them apart. The brain and the cosmos, like the internet, are networks and they evolve in the same way. The result, the authors argue, is that the universe really does grow like a brain. In a related article in the prestigious journal Science, researchers have discovered that the connections in the brain are highly organized the brain structure is like a grid of city wiring, the neurons traversing in all directions. Several years ago, the philosopher Clark Claymore published an intriguing paper, When is the brain like a planet? He provocatively concluded that when it, when it thinks, the brain parallels the ecology of our planet. The phenomenon like El Nino, which is coordinated with the weather events far away in Africa, is, is similar time series correlations observed in an MRI brain scan. Similarly, Greek seismologists at the University of Athens have concluded that the tremors before an earthquake are identical to the heart patterns before a heart attack. The similarities in physical systems can be inexplicable. We ourselves notice that the number of neurons in the brain, about 100 billion, is on the same order of magnitude as the number of trees on the Earth estimated by NASA to be around 400 billion. In their actual physical appearance, neurons like trees are uh, with a main trunk, the axon, and the branches, the dendrites, which comes from the Greek word dendron, meaning tree. Neurons connect together in a tree-to-tree -tree fashion as their branches nearly touch. The life of a single neuron is, an entang is as entangled with every other neuron as the trees in a rainforest. As a digression, there is an interesting theory that there might be uh, some kind of neural network connected between the vast unnatural monoculture in a field of wheat, where the heads are so closely together as to have uh, at the same height forming a living information matrix, and that this matrix can deform depending on information input, giving us crop circles not the ones done by Doug and Dave that are, of course. The fact is that all systems seem to be self-organized for the complex way that, replicate, that replicates RNA organizes a new strand of DNA to the way the brain produces a single picture of reality that organizes the firing of billions of neurons. The constants that rule the, evolu uh, rule the evolution of the universe are so precise that stars are organized to live through defined orderly stages and the formation of the galaxies from interstellar dust follows its own life cycle. In recent decades, it has become established that a single cell is a system, as is the brain and the entire body. You are presiding over an entire ecology. And like planetary ecology, everything finds a delicate balance. The phenomenon of homostasis is the body way of balancing hundreds of different functions. Bloodstream, digestion, uh, respiratory, waking and sleeping. It strikingly mirrors planetary evolution and its living responses to forces of balance and imbalance. The Gaia hypothesis, which looks upon the Earth as a single organism, may well apply to our own bodies as cells in the body of the cosmos as is the smallest, so is the greatest, has become full circle from ancient wisdom to modern science. Once we accept that every system is driven by feedback loops, homostasis, 
and continuing self-organization. At this point, it is up to dissenters to prove that we aren't inhabiting a living universe, tied into it by the most fundamental characteristics of biological systems. After all, if the hardware looks the same, then the software that creates coherence in every level might be the same. Even though everyone uses phrases like, I'm taking up my, I'm, I'm making up my mind, or my mind um, is not very sharp today. The my is only an assumption. When you get out of the shower, you are wet. You don't say, this is my wet. General qualities aren't individual. You can't call the Earth's atmosphere my air. In the same way, human pride is being able to think and reason uh, uh, may be a false assumption. The great quantum pioneer, Erwin Schrödinger, thought so. Quote, he said, there is obviously only one alternative, namely the unification of minds or consciousness. In truth, there is only one mind. And back to unity, the implication is that just as our bodies and cells in the body of the universe, our consciousness is immersed in the universal mind. But how would we go about validating it scientifically, going beyond resemblance of nature's systems give us a toehold? Studying the evolution of physical systems on Earth will tell us a lot about the evolution of the brain and vice versa. If the universe is encoded in the brain, then perhaps insights that science and philosophers have had in the past, breakthrough thoughts about reality are not so mysterious. Einstein was astonished that relativity, a theory formulated in his mind, turned out to match nature's workings so incredibly mathematically, uh, with such incredible mathematical precision. Infinity is hard to think about, but happily our brains keep evolving, having evolved to the point that uh, we can look out there and see incredible mathematical orderliness. We've reached the horizon where reality may reveal its true source. So simply, man is the part, the universe is the whole. However, they are the same thing. So in final conclusion, science is showing us that all is one. The divine wisdom is showing us that all is one. It is only man with his nature in both camps of spirit and matter that does not know he is one until he has experienced separation. He can then evolve back to the one and treat others as he would want to be treated. As a citizen of the universe, um, I'd like to end with the words of a, I think one of the greatest pop songs ever written. It says, imagine there's no country. Uh, it isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Thank you.